Hi everyone, welcome. This is Magister Gaming, and thank you for coming today for the second part of the race and synergies tier list. Today, what we'll be looking at is the mid game and the late game for the races. What are the strong races in the mid game, and what are the race and all the synergies that really are shy in the late game? To start this off, I will be reintroducing 12 of the tier list I made for the round 21 to 30 and for the round 30 plus. Let's look at the round 21 to 30. What happens at round 21 to 30 is when people usually stop saving, they have achieved their gold amount, which, which usually is 50, and they have usually reached level 7. So by now, most people do have 2 stars. And most of those lucky ones do have 2 star Razor, 2 star Shadow Thing, even a 2 star Long Druid. It's a little hard to get a 2 star Disruptor or 2 star Conquer right at the start, but those units are placed there. Other than the purple units, all of those units are placed there because they're 2 stars. That's the assumption for this tier list. And if you do want to check out this full explanation of those tier lists, I will attach this in the description below. So if you want to check it out, make sure you do. It's really detailed as well. Look at this tier list. What does this mean? It means raises a mage, raises an elemental. This is an orc. This is a demon, but we'll keep it in mind because Shadow Fiend is so strong in most lineup. Conquer is a warrior. Well, Long Druid is a beast and he's a druid, so he works in elves as well. And after that, we do have the elves, the warrior, undead, and there's a demon, demon hunter. And that's a warrior, orc, and demon. So notice how here I have prioritized on a lot of the AO units because I feel those units being two star is really powerful. And what does this mean for us? This means for us, usually at the start of the mid game, it's the AO units that really powers through. We do see that the elves have trouble dealing with AO units because elves don't have much HP, but they have great evasion. Warriors have trouble to deal with AOE units because most of AOE are magical damage. So does goblins. And so does a lot of other lineups. Only knights, I think, can solidly tank up from AOE because they can have a chance of super armor. Let's get into the first part of the tier list. I know it's a bit blurry, but bear with me. And also, guys, keep in mind, all the descriptions here are out of date. So that means some of the majors say 50 to 40% is out of date. What I'll show you is actually, let's go to Unblower. I was going to show this after, but let's see it here. Let's ignore the stars on the side because I made these stars as an overall conclusion comparison. This is to compare the mid game and the late game, and the stars are here to indicate a few things. We'll get onto the stars after. What I want to highlight is for the mid game, for the start of the mid game, the powerhouse are the beast. We often see players get run over by the beast simply because it's two or four beasts. Usually it's four beasts, and beasts do combine with warriors. Notice how in the first part of this tier list, we have one warrior, we have another warrior here, we have another warrior here. Three warriors are on the top tier list. And you can also have a disruptor that works well with warriors like Axe and Juggernaut. So warriors and beasts really go along. Um, often do we see elves and beast and warriors with beast. So this is what I mentioned. This is what I want to mention about the branches. I'm going to mention a few strong classes and races. Uh, I'm going to mention a few branches you can go into with them. For the beast, it's going to be warriors, elves, and that's the mainly the two things you want to go with. Of course, you can try the beast with goblins. You can try the beast with something else, even trolls. They do work, but not as well. Second thing I want to highlight is the dragons. Dragons really outshine most other classes at this particular part of the game because this is the start of people's rolling for units for two stars. This is the start of people getting to level eight after they're getting the savings. This is the very start of the mid game. And here, dragons, if you have a two-star dragon light, even after the nerf, he's great. A two-star viper is incredibly great. You can snipe a unit early. And a two-star puck is not bad in terms of damage, because he gain, our puck gains all its mana from the first orb that's free to cast with the dragon synergy. And why is dragon rated so highly in the mid game? Simply because there's only three units that you need and dragons can go along with so many other combos. For example, we can go with mages, we can go with assassins, we can go with knights, we can go with elves. And again, 
because its versatility, it's one of the powerhouses in the early in the game. The next one we'll look at after beast dragons is elves. After the nerf of elves, elves are still very strong in the mid game. And elves again can branch into so many other things. After the six elves, you can branch into assassins. After the six elves, you can branch into dragons. And you can also branch into hunters now because there's a new elf that's not included here, by the way, guys. The new elf is Marana. Marana, Windrunner, and the Dusa, perfect. Windrunner, Marana, and the Tide, even better. So keep that in mind. So right now, the powerhouse for the mid game, early mid game, is Beast, Dragon, Elves, and we have the Majors. The Majors are here. What do I mean by the Majors being a powerhouse in the mid game? Is that usually by now, most Mage players will have most of the units to two star or have the crucial units to two star. For example, the Razors, Crystal Maiden, Keep of the Light. Some of the lucky ones will be finding a one star Lich or maybe a 3 star ogre even, because most people don't pick ogres, it's like tiny or tony, most people don't pick tiny, most people don't pick ogres. So, and now we have the last two powerhouse for the mid game, which are the trolls, and which are the, ooh, where did it go, <laughs> which are the knights. So yes, I have included the ox into the warriors, which is also one, so we actually have two. Or three more for the powerhouse the knights when you have the four knights and if you get your knights two star they are very strong in the mid game i'm talking about the early mid game from around 21 to 30 and we all know how strong the trolls are for the early mid game because the trolls just got the four trolls everything attacks so much faster kills things so much faster with minus armor with a disruptor hex and this is why I want to say this is more like a two instead of three races simply because knights, chores, and ox they do coexist. So it, they do, it's like two circles interfering with each other. So they do have shared properties. So basically, what we want to see is we want to see a complete lineup of ox synergized by the warriors or synergized by the chores, even because chore is also a warrior. Axis Warrior, Juggernaut Warrior, we have three Warriors, we have the Ox. Also, we have the Knights. Batrider is a Troll and a Knight. You can have the Troll Knights. I know I'm going a bit all over the place, simply because I want to highlight as many as the powerhouse for the mid game. Right now, I'm not going to touch on too much on Assassins, which I'll start to talk about once we get to the late game, because I feel for the Assassins, the mid game and the late game is very similar. What does this mean for the mid game? The mid game is when, let's go back here, it's when AoE units really dominate from round 21 to 30. And in this particular mid game, there's two particular tasks for every player that's playing. The top players, they want to conserve the health, level up, and keep level up, or keep rolling for critical units, like a two star or three star high level units. For the players down in the bottom half, they want to survive. They want to spend as much as their gold. They want to not lose to the last few positions. They want to aim fifth, fourth, or even third position. So that's very conflicting. When the conflicting matters of the player's mindset comes in, what's going to happen is the top players are going to fall if they don't spend wisely. If they spend all their gold on leveling up, the team is not strong enough, they're going to lose to the players. Who complete the chores, they're gonna lose to the players who actually complete the ox. And usually this is when the players from below with the losing streak comes back. That's why it's so important to have a great AoE lineup. Most of the units here are AoE, except on the value units, because having an AoE lineup means we're versatile versus most of the classes. Let's have a look. We're good against beast, because they summon a lot. We're good against elves, because they can't dodge magic. We're pretty good against the Ox and Chores and Warriors because they again can't dodge AoE damage. They're great against physical but they're not so good against the magical. And here, the Knight is the only thing that counters AoE damage. When I say AoE damage, I don't necessarily mean you have to be mages. Just a simple Razor, 2 star, just a simple Beastmaster 2 star can do some AoE damage. But when you stack them with a Timber or with a Shadow thing, you can actually cleave the enemy. I'm not touching on the assassins and hunters until we get to the late game, which we'll do now. 
So now we're going to look into the late game. We did briefly talk about the mid game. Now, once we transition to the late game, we do notice that I'm using a lot of initiators on the top. And I do have some legendaries here compared to before. Because before I felt it was very hard to find legendaries that around those rounds. You'd be lucky with one, and most people do keep those legendaries. Over here, in the late game, round 31 plus, we do find a lot of legendaries, and we do find a lot of initiators. This, this is when the domination matter of the game becomes who gets his spells off first, and who can survive the longest. Who can be tankier, who can get a spell off first. So what does this mean? In the late game, the powerhouse, the ones that really outshine, is going to be the hunters and the mages. There's only two for me, particularly personally. Let's see, this is where the stars do come in. The hunters, they're strong because they empower the tide. The tide gets empowered. There's a high chance for tide and Dusa being hunters to cast the spells off early. And hunters, which I'll touch further over here, it's not bad in the mid game, but they really do get countered by a few lineup like mages, like elves, because hunters haven't completed the whole six hunter, or hunters haven't completed some of the critical two star or three star units. But over here in the late game, six hunters or three hunters can do a lot of damage simply because they have some of the fastest tide or so with items with small boost in terms of their attack damage. By having hunters they can get the spells off faster and you might have guessed in the late game late game mages are great simply again because the ability to get spells off fast if they can get spells off fast what that means is if you have a tide on the mage team a gyrocopter or even a doom or shadow thing they're going to get empowered by the crystal maiden which is a core mage unit and she's going to empower them with magic regeneration and they're going to cast faster so over here I'm really prioritizing for the late late game on who cast faster, who get the position right, and who can cast faster. Hunters cast faster because they give buffs to the tide and do so damage buffs. Mages cast faster because they give mana to the initiators like disruptor, tide, do so, and they can cast fast. Even like conquer is really great for the mages. So, other than those two. The great powerhouse for the late game is actually our good goblin friend. So notice how those are the three star late game units of the late game lineup I like. And the goblins are actually 2.5 star. For the goblins, because of the new buff, goblins give buff to everyone. That means they counter everything that is not magic. Also, you know, pure damage. The only thing that's pure damage is Enigma and Doom for the late game. Hunters need to worry about Dooms, they're okay because Doom is just a single target. Enigma is a big factor, but we can spread for the Enigma. So what really counters goblins is mages. The reason goblins is not 3-star in the very late game is because of mages and because of hunters. They can't rush the tide and do so and have them cast fast enough. And if goblins do get controlled, the hunters will snipe off each of the single units despite their physical damage because they have the do to control. While the mages will just burst everything down. Hunters is 2.5 star at the moment for me. And the other 2.5 star for the late game for me is Trolls. In particular, the Trolls have great utility in terms of Disruptor, which is one of the best initiator, similar to me with Tide. The Trolls have the Shadow Shaman and Witch Doctor to do the additional stunts to follow up. The Trolls can also go into several different lineups that makes me so versatile. They can go into Warlocks for the lifesteal, Plus, the, they can have the Warlocks with two or four on dead, which makes them squishy, but they can do a lot of damage. They can go into the Warriors for the tank cup for the mid-game transition. If they get some three-star Warriors, they're very strong. One of the best ones is Troll Knights, because Trolls does great damage when knights, four Knights have super armor. So Troll is a great safe bet to be top three usually in the late game simply because once they are complete most other combos can't defeat them with ease even if trolls lose you lose less health notice that if you lose less health after round 31 you tend to survive a lot that's why i do favor trolls and give it 2.5 star and the reason again they're not three star is that they don't cast as fast as hunters and mages now what do I mean by the other stars? The other stars are given because those lineup 
do go into the late game from the mid game very nicely. Dragons is one. Beast is one. Humans are a branch, by the way. I did this to highlight how strong human is. And assassin is the one I want to touch on right now. Assassin is very unique. They can be the powerhouse in, in the mid game, and they can be the powerhouse in the late game, but that's very situational. If you see my positional guide, which I also make a link below, if you have a defensive positioning against assassins, that means they can't hit all the squishy backlines. They can only hit the units you pick for them to hit, and they can't use all the assassins effectively because they're basically surrounding your defensive lineup and half of the assassins are melee that means they can't hit when the range jumps in first or sometimes it's a bad positioning so most assassins do fall off in the late game because people position properly for assassins but then there are ways to actually dominate the assassin with the mid game when you get a lucky rose or when you get a few two star assassin early say a two star templar to start Queen of Pain or Two Star Sand King can really make magic in the mid game. But Assassins are so unique and so special that I feel that if we include Assassin in the mid game, I might be misleading people. So I want to say, say it over here that Assassins are great in the mid game if you can get some of the core Assassins to two star. But in the late game, they do fall off because people will position for you. And what tends to happen in the late game is that people will position a defensive position because you see Assassins. Um, sometimes they just like to be defensive, like the trolls. Trolls love to go into the corner. Mages love to go into the corner. Hunters love to go into the corner. And you see why I'm very uncertain. I didn't want to mislead people with assassins. They're great fun to be playing with, but they get countered by positioning alone. And there's more things that counters them as well. For example, warriors counters them, elves counters them, even mages counters them. Not only for the positioning, but mages cast faster. If assassin gets stunned, they lose the two second window. They basically die because they're so squishy. For the next part of this particular guide, I'm going to touch on branches. What do I mean by branches? A lot of the two stars here have great branch potential. And that's something I do want to highlight for the mid game and the late game. You do want to go into the mid game strong, but you also want something with high branch potential. That means you can be versatile. You can be open up to a lot of the high value units in the mid game and the late game to have that ability to have a strong powerhouse unit. Let me give you an example. We talked about beasts going to warriors and beasts going to elves. We talked about dragon going to mages and dragon going to elves and even knights. So those are some great potential. Those are some great branching potential. Goblins have some of the best early game, but they lack the branching potential. So they do fall off in the mid game quite massively. I'll be making another goblin guide for us, and there I'll give you guys some hints on how to do goblins properly after many test runs. Humans, they start up here to highlight how strong they are because of the branch potential. We should always keep in mind if you have two humans, you do want to put your Humans in the front, except it's Crystal Maiden and Lina. Oh, keep out the light. So every other human other than... So but pretty much you do want to keep your Mini, Lycan, and Kanka in the front. They can serve as half of an anti page. You'd be surprised how many rounds, even with two humans, you can silence the enemy disruptor all the time, and that might just win you the crucial round for you. So I think humans are one of the best branches potential because of their ability to silence with a passive percentage. Yes, we don't count on it, but if it happens, it's magical. Ox, and there's a great branching potential. We're going to warriors, hunters, trolls, and you can only like imagine how many things ox can go into because you don't need the four ox. We need to keep in mind, guys, sometimes in the late game, having that 250, 300 HP is not going to change anything. What's going to change everything is your lineup synergy. I don't say about having fire armor or having more health is a lineup synergy. What I meant is sometimes being able to cast earlier, sometimes being able to deny the enemy casters is more valuable. So Disruptor is a must. Usually I keep a 3-star Juggernaut, maybe a 2-star Beastmaster just for a little HP for the Disruptor too, so he can be in the front. My Beastmaster in the late game becomes this unit that gives HP to the Disruptor. If I feel my disruptor is survivable enough by himself, I don't need other orcs. So that means orcs have great branch.
wrenching potential because Disruptor is still one of the best initiators in the late game. I don't need to touch on Trolls that much, but we do know Trolls can go into Warlocks, Undead, Knights, Warriors, and even Beasts with a 3-star long drill. Assassins have some of the great branch potential. You see Goblins running Assassins that dominates the early game. You see Elves running Assassins that invades everything. You see Elementals runs Assassins. You see Beasts runs Assassins. And sometimes you even see Nagas runs Slark. So Assassins are great. And you can also see Dragons runs Assassins. One of the big reasons I give Assassins 1.5 star, oh, no, close to 2 star, is because I feel Assassins have some of the great branching potential. I think in the mid game and the late game, if you look for the branching potential, Assassins do fall off as 3 Assassins in the late game, but in the mid game, they're still very relevant. Hunters, great branching potential. You can have Medusa and Tide in almost every party. Now imagine if you have a Beastmaster, all of a sudden you have three Hunters. Similarly, we're missing a Marana here. If you have Windrunner and Marana, you go into the Elves and you branch up with a powerful mid game into the powerful late game. Mages, one of the best branching potentials. We often see three Mages everywhere we go. Goblin Mages, Warrior Mages, Orc Mages, even Naga Mages, because you want Medusa and Tide. And that's perfect. You have the mana for Naga and for the Dusa and the Tide to be casting, and you have enough burst power to follow up. So mages have great branching potential. So that means they're versatile. Mages can go into dragons. You don't really want mages to go into hunters, or you don't want all the squishies. But you can have mages to go in with beast even. You give beast the mana to summon units. I'm not sure if you guys have tried it. A Crystal Madness 2 star with beast summonings, and if you do tank in the front line, it's very magical. You see, random are putting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, many of those little dudes, and just see a lot of summons. So, to summarize this particular guide, we follow the tier list I made earlier for the runs of the meta. We look at some of those high units, but we don't follow all of them. This is why it's so important to make dynamic decision making, not just based on one tier list, not just based on how much gold you have, not based on how much health you have, but also based on what is the unit composition you have. Sometimes I'm willing to spend more and save less because I know I'm stronger in the late game. And if you want a reference to that, make sure you check out my hunter guide, where I actually spend a lot to get my team up, and then I stop spending the moment I got some crucial units. And that's a very helpful early game guide as well. In the late game, we need to keep in mind initiators. The units that stuns you or the units you guys you stun the enemy are gonna be so crucial. We want fast initiators. Tide and disruptor are always my top tier. Doom is a situational unit. If you have something that gains in mana or something that gives him mana, like a crystal maiden, even a mage with a crystal maiden. The lineup with a Doom can really counter the enemy crucial unit, like a Tide or a Disruptor. So, what does this mean for us when we play? In the mid game, you want to have as many branching potential as you can. Once you get into the late game, you want to be somewhere with the powerhouse of the late game. Unless you do so well with the Beast, with the Dragons, with the Ox, or with the Assassins, you don't have to worry about that much for the late game. But if we don't do that well, we really want to branch goblins is the hard one. You really want some chores, hunters, and mages for the great late game comeback potential. So thank you guys so much for watching this particular guide. And I hope it's informative and I hope it shares some very nice insights for you guys. And thank you guys so much for the support on YouTube, liking, subscribing, saying hi on Twitter, saying hi on Twitch. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you guys next time.